Good Sunday morning and welcome to Church of the Cross on this fourth Sunday in Lent. We're so glad you could join us for worship this morning. We're excited because we are getting closer and closer to Easter, to the story of resurrection, of life. We're seeing that happen even around us as the world is sunnier and getting slightly warmer, though I've heard there's possibility of snow this week, but that's eerie. We could have a possibility of snow in July. These things happen, but we're glad you could join us to worship God this morning. Friends, just a quick couple of reminders to you. I uh, just sent an email out this week and also a post on Facebook that on Sunday, March 28th, we will have a return to in-person worship for all those who feel comfortable and ready to do that. Uh, we will re-implement our normal reopening plan, including you need to have a mask on. We're going to keep distance, but you won't have to get a reservation and worship will be as long as worship is. Before, we were holding it to about... 30 minutes, but uh, now we're not going to do that. There'll be some other little changes, but we'll have plenty of people to help you to understand and navigate those. If you have questions, you can always call the office and ask. We're also still in the midst of our mission for a month as we are collecting for the Mercy Center for Women. We're collecting things for kids like diapers and wipes and pull-ups and also move-out kits with uh, dishes and silverware and pillows and pillowcases and bedding, all those things. We have a list available uh, to you. It's on our Facebook page. You can always call the office and we can help you out or email it to you. Or you can just send a check to the office with March Mission or Mercy Center for Women on the memo line, either one. We'll make sure that that money goes to purchase those supplies. Well, friends, this is a day that we continue to think about our journey in Lent, our 40 days. And we're grateful to all those who have helped out thus far in worship. And we're grateful again today. We'll hear from Dave Gerline later. He's reading the scripture lesson for us. Dave Kale is going to sing a solo, and we have our regular bell players uh, during our reflective time. Sue Orn and Amy Fugate and Sue Tibbetts. And we have a special bell ringer this morning. Dawson Kale is going to ring the uh, Lenten bell. So it is a day of worship, and we're glad that we have so many folks to help out. Friends, let's focus our hearts and minds. Let's remember that we have been called by God to live as children of the light, to rise from the dead, and that Christ will shine on us. Remember also what the Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, that in Christ there is a new creation. The old is passed away, and the new is breaking forth. Friends, let us pray. Gracious God, in order that the children of earth might discern good from evil, you sent your Son to be the light of the world. As Christ shines upon us, may we learn what pleases you and live in all truth and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our opening psalm this morning comes from Psalm 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the rede redeemed of the Lord say so. Those he redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some were sick through their sinful ways and because of their iniquities endured affliction. They loathed any kind of food and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from destruction. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. And let them offer thanksgiving sacrifices and tell of his deeds with songs of joy. Friends, our reflective Lenten reading this morning is from Lamentations chapter 1. How lonely sits the city that was once so full of people. How like a widow she has become, she that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. 
Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals. All her gates are desolate, her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is bitter. Her foes have become the masters, her enemies prosper, because the Lord has made her to suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. Friends, let us pray. Almighty God, look with mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross. Amen. Friends, let's join our voices together and sing our first song, Create in Me a Clean Heart. Well, good morning, young disciples. Good morning to Dawson and Everett, who are here with us to help us to put more prayers on our peace tree. So, Everett, let's start with you. What do you got there? Let's see. First one you've got, we have peace within immediate and extended family. These are special prayers that folks at at home that we're not seeing right now, but they've sent them in this week and asked for us to pray for them and to put them on our peace tree. So we'll put that one up there. Dave is going to help us put them up there. So Dave, you want to find a good spot for that one. And what else do you have, Everett? Let's see here. To find stillness each day. I like that. Finding calmness and peace to be able to pray and reach out to God. You stick that one on, Everett. Where do you want that? There you go. All right, Dawson, what do you got? Let's see here. Lead with love. Ooh, ooh, that one catches you right in the chest. Whew. There you go. Yeah, there you go. We're going to spread them all out. There we are. Okay, what else do you got? Let's see here. Gratitude to church family. Absolutely. Let's see where that one's going to fit. All right, one more that was submitted to us, slow to anger. Man, these are good prayers this week. All things that we need to think about in our Lent journey. Absolutely. So we invite anybody who still has prayers, they can still send them in. We still need uh, plenty more to decorate our peace tree, but we want to focus on one special one this week, and that is peace in ourselves, within us. Not just peace in the world, that's what we're we really, really want to have happen is that there's no more war or fighting or anger. But to do that, we have to have peace in ourselves. We have to be comfortable, love ourselves, and know that God loves us. We, as with all of these prayers, they're all important things that we're asking God to help us with, but we all certainly need peace within ourselves. So let's pray this morning. Loving God, we offer up to you all these prayers that have been sent in, and we ask for peace within ourselves. Let us be an example of your peace and your love in this world. Let us lead with love, the example of Jesus Christ, that when we find peace in ourselves, we will make peace in our world. We ask this for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Phelps. Oops. Friends, this morning we welcome back Dave Kale. He's going to sing a special solo for us. Friends, our first scripture lesson this morning is from Numbers 21. to be read to us for, or read to us by Dave Gerline. Good morning, church family and friends from afar. What a beautiful blessing to be alive. Numbers 21, 
4 through 9. From Mount Hor they sent out, sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out, up, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they were, they were bit, the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord and take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put, put it upon a pole, and wherever a serpent bit someone, the person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Our second scripture lesson is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Friends, would you pray with me for just one moment? Lord, speak to these people whom you love through your most imperfect vessel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why is it so hard for us to change? Humans hate change. We really do. We are pattern individuals. Even those among us who are kind of spontaneous and creative, we still fall into our pattern. So why is it so hard for us to make change when we need to? In the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a psychologist who was doing a ton of research in this area, and he's still considered to be one of the experts in the field. His name was Prochaska. A few years later, he partnered up with a guy named Di Clementi, and they came up with this whole big concept called the trans-theoretical model. And that model broke out much simpler called the stages of change. We all go through this when we're trying to make change in our life, whether it's a big existential change, or if you were looking at something like needing to clean the bathroom, for example. We all go through this. We go through this process that starts in denial, and then it comes to some form of light acceptance, and then it comes to planning for the change, and then actual action of the change, and then keeping the change in force by maintaining it. Every person is like this. But it still doesn't answer the question, why is it hard for us to make that change? Interestingly enough, Scripture gives us this morning couple of answers that are really spot on based on what we see in psychological research. Two of the biggest reasons it's hard for us to change are impatience and identity. We want, when we are ready to make change, we want to make change right now, which is really not realistic. It takes time to make change. We have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of action and a lot of different things. 
The Israelites wanted to be in the promised land. They wanted to be there. They wanted to be there yesterday. But we all know their story. It took them 40 years. It took them 40 years to go from Egypt to Israel. And if you know anything about uh, the Middle East, Egypt and Israel are right near each other. So why did it take them 40 years to get there? Well, as we saw this morning, they lacked patience. They lacked knowing that God was in and amongst them and was at work. See, God had sent them manna and quail, had given them what they needed for their daily needs, gave them their daily bread, gave them meat. It's not what they wanted, but it is what they needed. But they didn't like that. They wanted what they wanted, and they wanted it right now. God was taking them to a land that was described as flowing forth with milk and honey, a rich pastoral land where they would be taken care of, and their animals would be taken care of, and where God would shelter them in God's presence. But that wasn't good enough for them in that moment in time. They had to have what they had to have, and they had to have it right now. That's our story. That's what we are like. If anything that these last 12 months, and we've just passed the one year mark of when this virus was declared a pandemic, if anything in the last 12 months that we've learned about the human condition is that we are just plain impatient. We can't be asked to wait, to delay our gratification for just a few months. We don't even want to be asked to wear a small piece of fabric on our faces. That seems to be too much for us too. But we lack the patience to realize that the ultimate goal, the big thing, the big win, if you will, comes a little bit later. We want it right now. We want to reopen. We want to return to our normal lives. But little did we realize how much those normal lives were killing us. The Israelites failed to mention or failed to understand that as well. They say to Moses something very interesting. Remember in their story, they had been slaves. They were building cities for Pharaoh. They were building pyramids and buildings for Pharaoh and for no pay. They were slaves in Egypt. They were treated poorly. Pharaoh didn't care whether they lived or whether they died. In fact, he would have preferred that the men died. He didn't want them to rise up. They were in a terrible situation in their life before, treated so poorly. And yet what they say to Moses that we hear this morning in in Numbers 21 is, why did you bring us out here to die? Why did you bring us out of Egypt, the land of death? Why did you bring us out here to die? Well, out in the wilderness, they had food. They had water and they had meat. It wasn't what they wanted, but it's what they needed. They had the presence of the liberating God in and among them. They had, a low, they had a leader in Moses who was specially chosen by God to lead them out of slavery and death and into that good, lush land. That still wasn't enough for them. They would rather, according to what we heard this morning, they would rather have stayed back in Egypt doesn't make any sense. But when we look in our own lives, when we look at the times that we need to make change, we can see that we'd rather stay stuck. And that ties into that second thing, that that idea of identity. At least we know where we are and who we are. Even if we know that those things are killing us, they're destroying us inside, At least we know who we are and where we are. Yeah, it would be better if we moved on to a different identity, if we tried a different way of life, but we don't know what that new way of life would look like. We're not sure. We know what this is, and we kind of have an idea what that might be, that changed life, but we're not ready to go there yet because it's an unknown land. Here we know we have what we want in this former life. In that new life, we will receive what we need, but we're just not ready to to, to jump over there yet. 
to remind the Israelites of what their life used to be like. God sends serpents among them. It's a very interesting thing that God chooses to use as a symbolic image to them. See, on the headdress of Pharaoh, the big fancy headdress that he would wear, there was a giant cobra made out of a copper bronze alloy, very shiny in color. It was understood in Egyptian lore that if he wore that symbol on his head, the cobras and the asps, which were very common in that region of the world, they could never harm him because he had power over them. That symbol that God sends among the Israelites is a reminder of their former life. Remember when that symbol, Pharaoh, was killing you. You want to go back to that? You want to return back to that old life where you were being killed by this foreign king? who didn't care about you, who wanted you dead, who didn't take care of you, who didn't have your welfare in mind. You want to go back there? Okay, we can do that. And so God sends this symbol of the serpents among them to remind the people, hey, every time you think about going back to the old life, just remember what it was really like. That's a lesson for us. But are we willing to hear it? I hear a lot of folks talking as we're getting closer with more vaccination rolling out and the mitigation strategies are working, hospitalizations are going down, all these good things. They're saying, I'm so ready to get back to the normal life. Friends, the normal life was killing us. The normal life was destroying us inside. In these past 12 months, rocky as they have been, we've had a lot of things bubble up to the surface. A lot of issues that we did not want to look at. Changes that we need to make in our world. Like treating workers fairly and giving them a living wage. We all depended on them during this pandemic. If it wasn't for the people who were working at the grocery stores and at the corner convenience and at the gas station and the delivery drivers and everybody else, we would have all been up a creek. We relied on those folks who scrape by in life to make a living. And then we all look at them and say, but you don't deserve a living wage. That doesn't make any sense. See, that was the old normal. The old normal was just ignore the people who are clerks and tellers and the people that we really depend on in our lives. Friends, we don't need the old normal. We need the new normal. We need this transition. We need to see where God has been leading us. We saw more in these last 12 months about the quest for racial justice and realizing, oh, hey, there's like a problem in this country with the way that people of color are treated. That became a surprising issue to many of us. But that was God, again, putting a serpent in our midst and saying, hey, remember the old life? You remember what that was like? That a person of color couldn't go to a corner convenience store without getting hassled or shot and killed. A kid couldn't walk down the street without getting pulled over. We all started realizing that there are huge issues in our society and that we need to change them. Change is painful. Change is hard. We're impatient. We hold an identity that makes us who we are. For good, bad, or everything in between, it is what makes us who we are. And we have realized, I hope, in these last 12 months, there's a lot inside of us that needs to change. There's a lot of evil in us. There's a lot of death and destruction inside of us. And it needs to change. It needs to be removed, thrown out. We can't embrace a beautiful world until we make that change. Just like the Israelites, they're never going to be able to embrace this promised land, this lush land flowing with milk and honey until they make the change inside and realize, I am not a slave anymore. I am a beloved child of God. The liberating, life-giving God who, who rescued me out of slavery and bondage and death and brought me on this journey, long and arduous as it was, to where God needed me to be, where I needed to be. 
One biblical commentator said that the journey in uh, the wilderness for 40 years, that God waited that long so that some of the most stubborn people in the group could die off. I don't think that's what happened in our pandemic, but it's an interesting thought. We had to remove the people that were holding us back. What if that happens in our midst, that there's parts of us that need to die off before that change can happen? That the most stubborn parts we get held, our lack of patience holds us in a time period where those stubborn, destructive parts of us can die away. And we can find new life again. See, that identity is a huge part of it. That's what the letter to the Ephesians was saying this morning. Sometimes we, we, we miss it. That first line there, you were dead. Were. Past tense. We could read that just as easily. You were dead, but you ain't anymore. You're alive now. And that's not because you're good. It's not because you figured it all out, because you're so powerful and so wise and intelligent. And the author tells us, you were dead, but you're not anymore because of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Because of our life-giving, sacrificial God who was willing to remove the things that blocked us, blocked our way to others, blocked our way to God. That Christ was willing to die to set us free, to liberate us from slavery and bondage and death, to bring us to brand new life. We're not dead anymore. And because we are not dead anymore, we can't live like we're dead. We can't have death and destruction and evil in our heads or in our hearts. We have to have a life and grace. That's what that passage in Ephesians is really driving at, is saying, you were dead, and you lived like people who are. You lived by the powers of the world. You lived by the senses, by the pleasures of the flesh. The things that made you happy in this moment in time. You did do, do those things, but not anymore. Because God has saved you, God has loved you, God has liberated you from all of that. You can't live that way anymore. You have to live as people of life, of abundant life. And that too is true for us. We can't live the old way. We've learned too many things. We, we've learned things as simple as, you know, we used to have birthday parties and we'd all blow on the cake and then we'd cut it up and pass it out. Like we've all learned that's disgusting. We probably should never have done that. So now we have to find a new way to do it. So how are we going to celebrate our birthdays? Well, for those of us as we get up in age, we rather prefer there not be any candles. One, it's embarrassing. And two, it's really hard to blow out that many candles. So maybe we could do one candle. We've learned other ways that we need to do things. we found ways that we can greet and interact with one another. We've thought about what our world looks like. We've had to take a second glance. We've had to realize who is really important in our society. We've had to learn how important human interaction is to us. And so our quest to be right, our quest to be divided, our, our quest to have power over, we got to shelve that because we realize that being together in human relationships matters way more than all that minutia that we normally argue about. Our lives together matter. If we've learned nothing in the last 12 months, then change is going to be impossible. If we are still impatient, if we are still holding on to an old identity, if we are still being defined by the ways of the world and not by the example of the gospel, then just don't even try. Just, just give up. But if we're willing, if we're in that stage, we're ready to make change. If we realize, yeah, there's some problems inside of me. There's problems in our world and they need changed. If we realize that even at a small level, then it's ready and time to make that change. 
if we are ready and willing to let go of our old life, our life which was defined by what we want and when we want it and how we want it, if our old life, our life of sin and death and destruction, if that's what we really want, sure, we can hold on to that, but we have had grace revealed to us. We've had grace poured upon our heads. We receive that grace each and every day. We are recipients of the abundant life of God. And so we're not supposed to live that old way anymore. We're supposed to get rid of it, dump it. It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians. We are new creations. And so we're supposed to live with Christ being displayed in us. Christ is in us, therefore we are that new creation. We can't live the old way. We have to live God's new way. Twelve months is not 40 years, but it's been a wilderness journey. It's been a journey of isolation and desolation and separation. It's been a journey of pain and loss. It's been a journey of transformation. Have we learned that God is calling us to a new life? That a new world is breaking in among us? That we have to recommit ourselves to the gospel, to the ministry of Jesus. To working to feed and to show mercy. To demonstrate care and concern. Have we learned that? Are we ready to embrace that new identity? The people, to be the people and to be the person that God wants us to be. To be a little Christ in the world. To be an example of his love. To be, as Paul would say, an ambassador for Christ. Are we ready to make that change? Are we ready to realize the world doesn't revolve around us? Where are you at today? Think about it. Reflect in yourself. Are you at least willing to listen? Maybe you're not ready to make that big change yet, but you're willing to listen to evidence. You're willing to consider all the facts. You're willing to think and to pray and to discern about it. Are you there? I hope so. Maybe you are ready to make change. Maybe you are ready to let go of the old life and to embrace the new life that God has revealed to you. When God grabbed a hold of you in Jesus, that was new life. Are you ready to embrace that life? Are you ready to go that direction? Gee, I really hope so on that one. Maybe you've already made that change. Maybe these last 12 minutes have been enough to really get you thinking, really get you moving. Is it time to maintain that change? To continue learning, to continue reading and praying. Continue thinking about what other changes each day need to be made. It's funny that as humans we hate change, but everything around us changes constantly. Everything is always changing. We, we don't want to admit that, but it's quite true. We're in a season of change right now. We're going from winter into spring. And yeah, we'll go back and forth a little bit. Maybe this week we'll have some snow. And so that spring weather we had before will get overtaken by more winter weather. But eventually the spring is going to break forth amongst us. That's change. And spring will give way to summer, and that's change. Even your favorite restaurant probably changes the menu every once in a while. That's change. Your favorite clothing brand doesn't fit like it used to 20 years ago. That's change. There's change constantly going on around us. God is making change. Are we ready to be part of it? To embrace it? To move forward into the world that God is designing and breaking forward among us? Or do we want to stay in the old world? Do we want to stay where there is no change? Where it's nice and safe? We can hunker down and stay right here. Yeah, sure, it's not that great. There's a lot of death and violence and stuff, but at least we know what that world is. Which one are you really willing to embrace? Are you ready to make change today? Friends, let us pray. Holy God of love, in Jesus Christ, you broke into our world and you made a huge change. Where death and destruction reigned, Lord Jesus Christ, 
you brought life. You removed the old world. You brought forth God's beautiful world. God of love, we thank you this day. We thank you for the change that you have made and are making in Jesus. We thank you that you rescued us from death and destruction. That you brought us from death to life. That we know resurrection life. That we don't have to be scared anymore. We don't have to live as creatures of death and people of the flesh. But we can embrace your holiness. Your beautiful will. The world that you are creating right in front of our eyes. God of love, we pray this day for the courage to make change. For the strength, the inner strength that it will take for us to let go of the old life and to embrace the new. We pray for wisdom to know which direction we should go. For the intelligence to make change as it becomes apparent to us. Most of all, we pray that we would both receive and give your grace. The grace that saved us. The grace that has saved this world. God, show us the changes you are making. Show us how we can be part of them. How we can embrace your life. How we can be led forward. Let us be the example of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O oh God. Grant us each day the newness of your life revealed in Jesus. These things we ask in his powerful name. Amen. Friends, our final song this morning is In Christ Alone. Please, let us sing together. Friends, in Christ alone we have received our life. The old life is gone. Death and sin and destruction are no more for us. We have received the love of God in Jesus which is life itself. Let us embrace that and make the change necessary to live as people of life. Get rid of the old way. To embrace the world as God is revealing it to us to be. This day and each day. Friends, until we see one another again, be well, be safe. Amen.